it's, it's not the case in the lower Great Plains. Okay, it is 8.01, so I will begin the webinar for this evening. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tom Logan, and I'm chairman of Fly Fishers International Board Conservation Committee. It's my pleasure to welcome each of you to Fly Fishers International Online Season 2. These webinars are your webinars. Uh, it's our intent that uh, they be of some interest to you and, and hopefully in some way will contribute to your enjoyment of fly fishing as a result of some of the information that we'll cover tonight. Perhaps most important is that these webinars are made possible only one way, and that's with your support as members of Fly Fishers International. These are your webinars, they are for you. Tonight's webinar focuses on conservation of fishes and their habitats. I hope each of you share my philosophy that conservation of our natural landscapes our lands, waters is essential to our enjoyment of the outdoors, our fly fishing, our qualities of life. That's the way it is. Conservation is very important to us in, in many ways. The conservation work that FFI does is based in science. That's our standard, and it's the only standard that really is acceptable for meaningful conservation, in my view. Our program tonight focuses specifically on applying science to the recovery of wild fishes and the waters where they live. Our guest tonight is our 2021 Fly Fishers International Leopold Award recipient for his distinguished conservation to fishes and the waters where they live. And we'll introduce him shortly in a more proper way. First, I'd like to introduce Jake McLaughlin that is in our headquarters uh, in, Lim in uh, Livingston, Montana. And he's on here tonight to help us with any problems, technical problems that uh, can always surprise us in some way. And also Rick Williams. Rick Williams has served with me for many, many years on our FFI Conservation Committee. We both are senior advisors on conservation to the organization. And Rick also <laughs> is lead for our steelhead and salmon subcommittee. There'll be monitoring questions for you that you can type in the question and answer button at the bottom of the screen, uh, not chat, but Q and A, and we'll get to those questions after our presentation tonight. Please know that this webinar also is recorded as is all of our webinars for uh, Fly Fishers International Online. The title of our program tonight is Born to be Wild, How Science Can Inform Recovery of Wild Idaho Salmon and Steelhead. And it will be presented by Mr. Russ Thoreau of the USDA Forest Service. I've asked Rick Williams to properly introduce Russ as he knows him very well, as well as the work he does. So Rick, I thank you very much and you have the floor if you don't mind. All right, good evening. <clears throat> Welcome to uh, the conservation webinar series. I'd like to introduce Russ the Row. Uh, Russ is a longtime friend and colleague. Known Russ probably 25 years or so. Um, and, and we've known of each other even longer than that. We both have worked on Columbia River salmon issues. Uh, Russ does, you know, did graduate work at the University of Idaho in fisheries, did some pioneering work on cutthroat and catch and release on the St. Mary's River and Kelly Creek and St. Joe in Northern Idaho. About the same time catch and release was first starting in Montana. It was seminal work and it's really led things. He worked for Idaho Fish and Game and then transferred to the Forest Service to the Rocky Mountain Research Station here in Idaho where he's been a research scientist ever since. He's probably the region's foremost expert on Chinook salmon in the big Idaho central wilderness areas of the Frank Church wilderness. Russ is a good friend, fishing buddy occasionally and a great colleague. And like I said, we're really proud to have given him the uh, Aldo Leopold Conservation Award last year. So take it away, Russ. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate it. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And let's see here. OK. 
Okay, so thanks. And I really appreciate the award from FFI. It's a great honor. So I'm going to discuss how science can inform recovery of wild Idaho Chinook salmon and steelhead. And to give you some context, as you know, salmon are a keystone species. They have a very important ecological role, but they're also important for humans. And they have been in central Idaho for at least 12,000 years as a food source for cultural and ceremonial reasons and for their economies. Salmon are all also what we call an Idaho and Northwest icon. I live in Salmon, Idaho on the Salmon River. We have companies that name their companies after these fish, and they're really part of the fabric of who we are in the Northwest. What do Idaho salmon need? Well, you hear a lot of talk about the complexity of salmon recovery, but it's really not that complex because salmon need three things. First, they need high quality natal habitat, which is spawning and rearing habitat. Then they need a migration corridor to and from the ocean, which is where a metric I'll talk about, SAR is measured. And then they need an estuary in an ocean. So the point here is that in order to understand Idaho salmon and steelhead, we really need to look at the broader context of all three of these components. Two life stages I'm gonna talk about a lot tonight. One is the egg to pre-smolt stage from when eggs are buried to when the fry hatch, when they emerge, rear as par, and finally migrate out as pre-smolts to the ocean. And this occurs entirely within that natal habitat. The second life stage is a smolt to adult life stage, the acronym here being the SAR. This is from the time the smolts leave, they rear in the ocean as adults and grow, and then they eventually come back as adults. And the Power Council goal for SARS is a mean of 4% and a range of two to six. And the Independent Science Advisory Board recently wrote, this objective provides a readily measured first order objective for restoring stock. So the point is it's scientifically based and well accepted. Columbia River Basin that we're part of historically was the most productive Chinook salmon habitat in the world. What were the historical ranges and abundances? The word that comes to mind is immense. In 1805, Lewis wrote, salmon numbers are quote, almost inconceivable, unquote. And think about that because the Corps of Discovery came across the Great Plains when they saw literally millions of bison, antelope, and plains elk, yet they struggled for words to describe the abundance of salmon. How many fish? Estimates are 10 to 16 million annually came into the Columbia, two to six million into the Snake Basin. And the Snake Basin was disproportionately important because although it comprised less than 12% of the Columbia flow, it supported more than half the steelhead, almost half the summer Chinook, and about 40% of the spring Chinook. And those immense runs brought a lot of benefits to Idaho and the rest of the Northwest. In 1959, you could fish for salmon and catch two salmon a day. You could fish for spring Chinook and summer Chinook for almost three months and fish the entire snake, salmon, clear water, main stem rivers, as well as most of their tributaries. What's the contemporary fishery been? Well, in 2019, the few hatchery supported fisheries were even closed. So few fish, even the hatchery supported runs are not supporting fisheries. The Snake River by the 1880s was down to about one and a half million Chinook. In 1995, there were 12, less than 1,200. That's 1,200 Chinook, wild Chinook returning to Idaho. That's a 99% decline. How on earth did this happen? Well, the federal agencies have termed them the four H's, unregulated excessive harvest, particularly pre-early 1900s, natal habitat destruction, hatchery practices that reduce wild fish production, and finally, hydroelectric dam development. What's left in the snake? Well, in the red outline there, in the southern part of it, you'll see the Hell's Canyon Dam complex that blocked the Boise Payette Weezer, which were big producers. North of that red line, you see Dwarshek Dam, which blocked the upper Clearwater. But the good news is within that red area, there's still more than 3,000 miles of good to excellent habitat, much of it in wilderness or, or protected areas. So we can ask the question, how are wild Chinook doing in this good habitat? Well, unfortunately, like a lot of things nowadays, it depends who you ask. In 2016, 
the courts ordered the so-called action agencies to hold a series of open houses to discuss the status of Columbia Basin salmon and steelhead. And I attended the one in Boise and they reported salmon and steelhead abundance is improving. They showed this graph to document that. And I have to admit, I stood there and looked at this for a long time and challenged the people that were showing it. And then they went on to say, this is the most complete data available. Well, it's absolutely not. However, that has encouraged others to say, salmon numbers are trending upward. Populations are trending upward, strong at, e at times, even record setting salmon runs. Well, Aldous Huxley anticipated this sort of thing when he said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you mad. And I really hope this makes you mad because this is the actual trend from 1957 through 2019. And what the open houses did is they parsed out this data to make it look like things were improving. And if you look at the trend again, realizing that in the 1950s and 60s, about half of those runs were being harvested, the actual trend line is much steeper, a much steeper decline. So why did this happen? Well, all four H's certainly contributed, particularly in those early years, but in more recent years, perhaps one of the H's in particular main stem passable dams built above Bonneville, particularly these last four dams, which are coincident with those steep declines. I'll come back and talk about this spike in a few minutes. So here's how our, our Idaho salmon get to and from the ocean. They come down the salmon, down the snake, down the Columbia, and they do this arc off the Aleutians. They may go 4,000 miles a year, and some fish do this multiple years, just remarkable. But this is where the changes have occurred in that green circle. And evidence suggests that the primary cause of these Snake River declines is the hydrosystem development because these fish now must navigate eight dams to the ocean as smolts and those eight dams, same eight dams on the way back as adults. And NIMP's own recovery documents clearly say that this is a primary threat to viability. I'm going to talk about the changes that have been, that have occurred as a result of that hydrosystem development. First, reduced survival in that SAR stage I talked about. In the 1960s, Corps of Engineer biologists measured SARs of 3.5 to 6.5% with four dams in place. And SAR basically means for every 100 smolts that go out, three to six adults come back. And you obviously need at least two for replacement. Since those four additional dams were built to make eight dams, SARs have often been less than 1%. And in fact, from 2000 to 2018 in the most recent CSS report, we've been averaging 0.7. So much less than the two to six range and much less than the 4% mean. Second change is dramatic in-river changes. 325 miles of reservoir in what used to be a free flowing river. This is near the Dalles. You can see the complexity of the habitat in that main stem Columbia in the 40s and 50s. This is what it looks like today since 1972. And that has also dramatically reduced water travel to increase water travel time. It used to take a drop of water two days to go from where Lower Granite sits to Bonneville. Now it takes an average of 19. And in drought years, it's about 40 days. And keep in mind that the smolts are going through a physiological change, allowing them to go from freshwater to saltwater. So time of migration is really critical. And where they're delayed, it increases mortality. The third change is the cumulative effects of multiple dams. Here you see the blue line, the Snake River above eight dams, the red line, the John Day above three dams. And if you look closely, you should be able to see that into the late 60s, early 70s, those lines are pretty parallel. And then they start to diverge as the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth dams are built. Today, our Snake River fish survive one quarter as well as those downriver populations. Aldous Huxley also said, an unexciting truth may be eclipsed by a thrilling lie. Well, here's a thrilling lie. Quote, we are seeing survival numbers for juvenile fish that rival and sometimes exceed what you see on undammed rivers, unquote. Here's the unexciting truth. This is a plot of Chinook salmon SARs versus dams for three different populations. First, the John Day above three dams, 3.5. The Yakima above four dams, 2.5 the snake above eight dams, 0.7. And the important point here is 
So there's the 4% SCR. We're less than, a, less than a quarter of that in the snake. The important point here is that warm water conditions in the ocean, the so-called blob, sea lion predation, treaty and non-treaty harvest are the same for the John Day Yakamon snake. The big difference here is the number of dams these fish are passing, and that's having this dramatic effect on SARs. Fourth change is much higher water temperatures. If you read the papers in 2015, you saw that 380,000 sockeye died while migrating up the Columbian snake. They come in later than our Chinook and steelhead, so they're subjected to much warmer water. For Snake River fish, 96% of the sockeye destined for Idaho died between Bonneville and Lower Granite because of those elevated temperatures. But you may be like Homer. You may have read things that suggest, well, I thought the fish were doing just fine. And you may have seen this data, these data, this was actually in the EIS that came out last February saying that SAR uh, survival at each dam is 92 to 98%. So things are just fine. Well, first of all, it's measuring this from the top of the dam to below the dam. If a fish is still swimming, it's alive. So it's only acute mortality. It ignores delayed mortality, which is the fish are so beat up going through these different projects that they don't survive. And importantly, it completely ignores reservoir induced mortality. These reservoirs slow the migration, fewer fish survive. In the case of steelhead, some of the smolts even residualize and don't migrate. In addition, we've stocked largemouth, walleyes, and other great game fish, but they don't belong in a smolt migration corridor. The other half of the story then is we not only want smolts to survive to the ocean, we want to make sure those adults are coming back. And as noted, Power Council goal, mean of 4%, we're averaging 0.7. So the Columbia Basin today is the most hydro-developed salmon habitat in the world. And there's a couple of great documents I would urge your members to find. This one is by Megiddo and Ebel. It's about the history of the Corps of Engineers and, and trying to protect salmon. And then another great book by Jim Likatowicz, Salmon Without Rivers. And the important points here are, they talk about the distortion of the truth. They talk about data that were suppressed by the core. And they also talk about and explain the perils of ignoring science and how we got to the point today where these stocks are ESA listed. So in 1972, the Endangered Species Act was passed. By 1980, Congress recognized hydro was a major factor in salmon declines. Prior legislation had been ineffective and they passed a piece of landmark legislation. The Northwest Power Act required equitable treatment of fish and wildlife. It created the Power Council. And a lot of us, Rick and I in particular, were very excited about this. We thought this would be the turning point for recovery. So how successful was the act? Well, it was passed here. And around 10 years later, all stocks in the Snake River Basin were ESA listed. So the act was essentially ignored and not implemented. It was politicized. So the Columbia Basin today supports one to two percent of historical run sizes. What has been the federal response? Well, legally, they're required to develop recovery plans and biological opinions, so-called biops, that provide actions to offset impacts of other factors like the hydro system. There have been five biops since 1994. And what's been the focus? Primarily on restoration of the estuary and natal habitat to mitigate hydro mortality. Same approach, all five. How effective is that? Well, the courts have said these biops, none of them have been scientifically sound. They've been thrown out of court. And while it's great to uphold the science, this has been a treadmill that has not helped our fish. We've just, a new biop comes out, it's challenged goes back. So we're still not doing taking the action necessary to recover. And this is because when that's the bottleneck, failure to improve those SARs is going to be an ineffective response to that high smolt mortality. Because 80% of the variation in salmon survival is explained by SARs. And when SARs are less than 1%, like we have currently, we see steep population declines toward extinction. So despite more than $17 billion, that's a B, spent on fish and wildlife restoration, all Snake River anatomist fish remain at high risk of extinction. Just today on a radio interview, I heard Rep Representative Mike Simpson say, we are managing salmon toward extinction, unquote. And that's really a pretty accurate statement. 
Maslow said, if the only tool you have is a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. Well, the hammer that's been applied in the Columbia has been natal habitat restoration and minor hydrosystem improvements. This is not going to achieve salmon recovery. The proper tool is this, increasing those SARs. How do you do that? By increasing water travel time and by reducing the number of powerhouses these fish have to go through. Judd Simon clearly said these dams are causing irreparable harm to imperiled fish. And last year, he directed the agencies to prepare an EIS that finally would address all alternatives because one alternative, the Snake River restoration through dam removal has really been off limits until then. So here's the executive summary of that EIS that came out last February. Strategy is built around flexible spill. The preferred alternative actions could increase SARs by 35%. We're still less than 1%. And not surprisingly, the Fish Passage Center said this is going to keep stocks from declining. And the Pacific Fisheries Management Council said it's insufficient. It's not going to provide healthy and harvestable runs. So what will achieve recovery? A science-based framework, that one that listens to all the science and inform public, that's all of you and policymakers that you influence and outside basin actions to improve SARs two to six fold. I wanna talk about the ocean just briefly. The ocean is a big driver in salmon populations. It affects survival, always has, always will. When we have favorable ocean, we see larger returns. When we have unfavorable ocean, we see fewer returns. But we have limited ability to influence the ocean other than to get our act together nationally and across the world on carbon emissions and climate change. And the Independent Science Advisory Board has also stated that climate change is considered an uncontrollable factor at the basin level. In contrast, we know that human caused hydro development is clearly linked to declines through those reduced SARs we talked about through the increased water travel times, reduced water travel times. And we have extensive ability to improve those conditions because we have created them. And similarly, the ISAB stated hydro system is a controllable factor. There is a path forward. In the 1990s, more than 30 participants from state and federal agencies, tribes, universities, consultants gathered as part of the plan for analyzing and testing hypotheses. It was a collaborative effort to address measures to recover anadromous fish in the Columbia Basin. The path conclusions clearly stated that the natural river option is the only option that will provide recovery. It has the highest certainty of success and the lowest risk of failure. So we, there is a scientific basis for salmon recovery. Those path conclusions have been reaffirmed for the past 23 years. Here's a quote from 1999. The weight of scientific evidence clearly shows wild snake river salmon steel lake cannot be recovered under existing river conditions. The comparative survival study report recently stated, estimated a two to three fold increase in abundance with a natural river option and a four fold increase coupled with max spill. Those would achieve those SARs goals that the Power Council has set. And finally, just last month, a group of emeritus scientists, including Rick, sent letters to the Northwest governors and stated based on overwhelming scientific evidence, restoration of a free flowing snake river, lower snake river is essential to recover wild salmon and steelhead in the basin. So this is because when you improve those SARs, it's a much more effective solution for recovery. So that's kind of the background for the broader Columbia Basin and how our Idaho fish fit in it. Now I'm gonna focus in on the area I know best, the Middle Fork Salmon River drainage in central Idaho. And I'm gonna provide a case study of wild Chinook salmon in wilderness habitat. A lot of collaborators from my own agency, from other state, federal, tribal entities and universities. So most landscapes are altered as you know, but one shining exemption is the Frank Church wilderness. It's a very large area. It has core habitat for a number of ESA listed and sensitive species. And it's an excellent study location because we can control for several variables, specifically some of those four H's. Middle Fork has diverse, high quality, connected, complex natal habitat. It's not habitat limited. 
Secondly, it has wild indigenous salmon. There are no hatcheries in the middle fork, no hatchery fish are planted there. Third, based on coded wire tag data, ocean harvest rates are very low on these populations. And the river treaty and non-treaty harvest has been about 9% the last 20 years, more than we'd like, but that is not what's driving these fish toward extinction. So relatively low harvest and within Idaho, it's been 42 years since you could legally harvest a wild Chinook salmon. 0 for 42 is a pretty egregious batting average. So key questions that we ask as scientists are, how do we conserve what's left knowing we do have remnants? Where are salmon likely to persist in the future? And then how do we inform recovery not only within the middle fork, but in a broader area? So the approach we've taken is actually census the population using reds or nests as surrogates. And here's a salmon nest female excavates, buries multiple egg pockets. And our fish, each female digs one red on average. We have a one-to-one -one sex ratio, multiply reds times two, you get an approximation of adult numbers. We've also evaluated genetic structure of these stocks and described the habitat and the processes that create and alter that habitat. We have some remarkable databases. The first one I'll term the IDFG index red counts for idle fish and game, the red Streams on the left map are the index areas. These have been standardized since 1957. We have a 63 year database now, and it was created, initiated and maintained by these iconic biologists. And sadly, Stacy Gebhardt's just left us a few months ago. Second database is what I'll call the RMRS for Rocky Mountain Research Station, red counts. This has been annually replicated since I started them in 1995. It's a complete census of all those areas outside the index areas, 25 years now. Third, we have genetic information from carcasses. Today, I'm only gonna talk about DNA microsatellites. And finally, we're assessing effects of widespread natural disturbances. So what are the applications of these data sets? First one is, how unique are these fish? And if you forget everything else I talk about tonight, I want you to remember how incredibly rare and unique and invaluable these wild populations are. No others in the world migrate so far and climb so high. They're migrating up to 900 miles in some cases. Some of these fish are spawning over 6,600 feet in elevation. A friend of mine calls them mariners and mountaineers, and somebody else recently called them the ultra marathoners. Those are both apt descriptions. Secondly, wild native fish like this are very rare in the Columbia system. Only 4% of the historic spring summer Chinook range still supports wild fish like these. Everywhere else should either been extirpated or they've been altered by hatchery stocking. Third, they have very diverse life histories. They spend from less than a year to two years in freshwater from less than a year to five years in saltwater, plus some males mature entirely in freshwater. You add all that up, we have the potential for 18 different age classes contributing from prior brood years. And that diversity spreads the risk, buffers fluctuations, and enables those stocks to adapt to that very dynamic environment they're in. Fourth, they're still genetically diverse, which is amazing considering the low abundances we've had. They have both within and across population differentiation. So the fish in lower Camas Creek are genetically different than the fish in upper Camas Creek. Camas differs from loon, differs from big, for example. We can ask questions about spatial dynamics. How are they distributed across space and time? Because they have, we have these spatially continuous, temporally replicated data for 25 years now. We can ask about population trends. Here's a plot of the middle uh, IDFG index areas, 1957 through 2019 in this case, we can ask how do these populations compare to the overall Snake River Basin? And if you can see that, and again, I'll come back and talk about that spike, they're, they're almost parallel lines, which is pretty remarkable when you consider that the Middle Fork has optimal habitat, no hatcheries, low harvest. So those three H's don't really apply. And this confirms that one H the hydro system drives the trajectory of both of these populations. Here's the RMRS complete census this is our best estimate of total number of reds in the middle fork the last 25 years. 1995, 20 reds, two zero in the entire middle fork system, 700 miles of spawning habitat. Early 2000s, we jumped up around 2000 reds. We've averaged 766 and I'll put that in context in a minute. 
We can ask questions about resiliency. Whoops, what is resiliency? It's ability to withstand negative conditions that could drive them to extinction. And conversely, ability to respond positively when conditions improve. One of the ways we can measure resiliency is doing a recruit spawner analysis. And I don't have time to get into the details here, but the results reveal among the highest values ever recorded for spring, summer Chinook. This is clear evidence of resiliency, most likely a result of the high quality natal habitat and the many eggs, an average of 5,000 per female that these fish produce. More evidence of resiliency. So I've been teasing you with that spike that occurred there in that Snake River Wild Chinook plot in the upper right, that occurred right here. 2001, 2002, 2003 was a result of higher snowpack, more runoff, faster travel time meant more fish survived through the hydro system. And then we had a corresponding upturn in ocean productivity. Cold water upwelling, more food, high lipid content, copepods. So we had more survival in the ocean as well. That resulted in a five-fold increase in numbers of adults returning. And look where those high numbers came from. They came from those abysmal years in the late 90s. So that's very clear evidence of resiliency. Conditions improved, fish dramatically responded. There were even newspaper articles then that said, we've solved the salmon recovery issue. Well, we didn't solve anything because from 2003 to 2006, there was a tenfold decline in abundance, which illustrated that the factors that caused these stocks to be ESA listed in the first place persisted. Mother Nature just did us a favor and the fish responded. We can ask questions about landscape processes. Western landscapes are extremely dynamic with fires and floods and snow avalanches and debris flows. Our fish evolved with these. They look bad to us, but the fish have adapted to them. Likatowicz wrote, the Pacific Northwest has been more geologically active than any North American region. Some key concepts here are complex life histories like we have in these wild populations result from disturbance. And life history diversity becomes the solution of survival in those very dynamic environments. So if you have investments, you're aware of the portfolio effect, diversity reduces risk. This is a plot of Bristol Bay sockeye over a 50 year period. The individual lines are individual populations. This thick line is an average of nine populations. And what you see is individual populations jump all over the place annually. But because of that diversity of nine populations, overall production remains high. So a key concept is to maintain key ecological process in order to generate that biocomplexity. And conserving that biocomplexity then increases species viability in an uncertain future. What's that mean? It basically means that in the era of climate change, having that biocomplexity is our best bet to maintain populations in an uncertain future. What are the key processes? For us, fire is a huge one. More than half the Middle Fork drainage has burned since 1990. And when those fires when storms occur on those areas that burn, we have debris flows like this that add a lot of alluvial material. It looks bad to us, but really what these post-fire debris flows are doing is replenishing salmon spawning gravels in these high gradient systems. We also see localized huge inputs of wood off these burned areas and snow avalanches. There were four of these in Upper Big Creek in 2014. And incidentally, the Chinook made it through those just fine. Pretty amazing. These also create complex habitat and sort substrate. So this essential natural ecological process, fires, floods, debris flows, alters the landscape to create and maintain a diverse habitat template, which in turn allows for the expression of salmon life history and genetic diversity, which both lead to population resiliency. So if we are gonna build a blueprint for recovery, middle fork populations are really good indicators for a much broader area, perhaps the scale of the Snake River Basin. To enhance recovery, we'd want diverse genetics. We'd want abundant quality connected habitat. We'd want unique locally adapted fish and we'd want demonstrated resiliency. So there's good news. It is totally feasible to recover these populations. All the building blocks for recovery still persist. However, these populations are also at high risk because they fail to meet viability criteria. Those are ESA-driven biological performance measures. 
NIMPS recovery plans state all Middle Fork populations are non-viable and high risk of extinction because of low abundance and low productivity. And here's a plot of that for one of the drainages, Marsh Creek. The blue is where we are, the green is where we're trying to go. So we have this big gap in recovery. So there's troubling news. We have unique wild stocks and core wilderness habitat that are at high risk of extinction. So question is, will the biops natal habitat focus fill a gap? Well, if natal habitat restoration degradation is responsible for stock declines, then populations in high quality habitats should fare better than stocks in degraded habitats. Are they? Well, we have an experimental control. We've been studying wild salmon and wilderness for decades. And the fact that these wild populations are at high risk of extinction confirms natal habitat restoration is not sufficient to achieve recovery. And other research agrees. NIMPS document habitat actions in the Middle Fork will not produce increases in survival to achieve viability. For the Snake River population, potential for improving overall survival through habitat restoration is low to non-existent for most 84% of the populations. Where are the exceptions? Places like the Pasimroy, where barrier removal is improving habitat, the Yankee Fork, where large wood restoration is occurring, the Lemhi, right off my back door, where reconnect and reconnection of tributaries is happening. These are all good projects. They're increasing freshwater capacity, but they're analogous to preparing for recovery. Quality natal habitat's essential. However, habitat doesn't make salmon. Salmon makes salmon. The point is, we need natal habitat, but we also need to get the fish to and from that habitat. An example of this is the Lemhi River. In the 1950s and 60s, the Lemhi River was severely degraded by a number of things, channelization, all kinds of stuff going on in the channel. Red counts, in the early 60s, they averaged almost 1,600 reds annually. Well, contemporary Lemhi River has had a lot of emphasis on channel restoration. What used to be the old single channel, the red channel that was channelized, now they're recreating these new channels, the diversity, better rearing habitat, better spawning habitat. A lot of collaboration and cooperation for ranchers are making a lot of sacrifices for the fish. What are the red counts? 2019, there were 81 reds, that's 3%. So we have far improved habitat but a fraction of the reds that were there under the degraded habitat in the 60s. So trends in wild populations and wilderness as well as areas like the Lemhi confirm that within basin actions are not gonna be sufficient to recover these Snake River fish. Why do we know outside basin factors are limiting recovery? Well, let's look at those 2001, 2002, three years when more salmon returned. Expected trajectories from more adults and more juveniles would have been like this. Instead, it was like this. The reason is increased mortality outside those natal areas negated the benefits of more adults and more juveniles. So those are the factors that are driving these low SARs. So how do we rebuild snake over salmon? We improve SARs. Where do we focus? Outside the Idaho basins to address those factors. So outside basin actions are essential to increase the SARs. There is no within Idaho solution. We have to work in that migration corridor, that second necessary habitat component. We also need to inform policymakers about low abundance of these fish. I told you that we've been averaging 766 reds a year the last 25 years. How does that compare to historical? Our estimates are the Middle Fork supported 24,000 reds on average in the 1950s and 60s. So we're about 3% of what was there in those periods. And 2017 was about 1%, 2019 was less than 1%. Last year we had a big increase, but 2020 was still less than 2% of those 50s and 60s abundances. And if you look at the Columbia River Basin Chinook salmon harvest data, the 50s could have been, and 60s could have been about 30% of the potential. So that means that Middle Fork could have supported 70,000 reds or 140,000 adults. And if that seems like a ridiculously high number, consider the fact that in the 1940s, biologists mapped all of the spawning areas in the Middle Fork 
and they estimated how many fish that could support. Their estimate was 92,000 reds. Keep in mind, we've been averaging 766. So we have now about 1,500 adults returning on average years in contrast to 140 to 180,000 in the 50s and 60s. There's something called the shifting baseline syndrome. It was first postulated by Pauli. And basically it means that with each generation, the expectation of ecological conditions shifts downward and standards are lowered. So we judge what we think potential is based on our current experience. So as things decline, we get a skewed view. Well, this is the bounty that was folks. Two young men caught 23 salmon up to 43 pounds in one day near Salmon, Idaho. Now that's pretty excessive by our standards today, but the point is this is the abundance that was. 1950s, those are steelhead folks. Those are fish in excess of 40 inches in some cases, 20 plus pound fish. In the 1970s, still in the early 70s, you could catch your limit of salmon and steelhead and you could shoot a big bull elk. So the shifting baseline syndrome is particularly dangerous because it means we have a lack of awareness of historical abundances. It overlooks true potential and the result could be unrealistically low recovery goals. In fact, NOAA's viability goal for the middle fork is only about 10% of what we're saying the true potential is. And with so few fish, we have a loss of ecological, cultural, economic, and recreational values. Here's an example of that. These are red areas, the red lines, are current steelhead, hatchery steelhead harvest zones. The green areas are areas that formerly were open for steelhead fishing. Now they're basically wild fish refuges where you can't fish. And that has really had a major economic hit on local communities that depend on these fisheries. Places like Riggins, Idaho. In 2001, when we had that big increase in wild fish, there was a corresponding increase in hatchery fish that supported a fishery. And about a quarter of Riggins annual sales were from that fishery that year, much larger than ag and timber. So when you have that severe loss of marine derived nutrients too, fewer salmon reduces the productivity and function of both aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems because those marine derived nutrients end up not only in the stream, but up on the hillside and the ponderosa pine, et cetera. And here's an example of that. 1,370 years of isotopic nitrogen measured in redfish lake sediments. And that highlighted area is the period of Columbia and Snake River Dam construction. And as a biologist friend of mine with the Shoshone Bannock tribe said, we're headed for bankruptcy. So current salmon population recovery goals are far below the production potential. And this is gonna affect, adversely affect us, already is, as well as the ecosystem. And we also need to inform policymakers about a changing climate, which adds urgency. Climate change is here. We're seeing the effects in freshwater. We're seeing the effects in saltwater. And a change in climate really adds urgency because it's going to exacerbate those main stem passage issues, particularly temperature, and reduce freshwater habitat. So how does salmon survive that future? Well, we talked about diversity. And that diversity means it's prudent to promote and maintain those life history portfolios. Here's another paper. Salmon are buffered to changing conditions with behavioral and life history diversity. So restoring salmon numbers is a priority because it increases that buffering. So the point is these wild, rare, locally adapted Idaho salmon are best suited to adapt to an uncertain future. And the more of them we have, the more buffering there's gonna be and the more likely they will persist. We know that low elevation cold water habitats are gonna warm and become unsuitable in some cases. But even here, there's some good news because the Snake Basin has an abundance of high elevation habitats that are going to remain Colorado refugia. Climate scientists and other biologists have been studying this, and these cold water high elevation areas are going to persist even in the face of climate change. So if restored, these wild Idaho salmon and steelhead could be uniquely adapted to buffer against the changing climate. and they could also be used to refound populations that blink out at lower elevations. Now the reverse is never gonna happen. You're not gonna take a coastal short run Chinook salmon 
and train them how to migrate 900 miles and climb 6,600 feet. But the point is these low elevation areas that could blink out, if we had robust populations in central Idaho, they could be used to eventually refound stocks in other areas. So there's this dynamic tension. Wild salmon and steelhead are high risk from outside basin factors, from low abundance, from truth distortion, and from a changing climate that adds urgency. But conversely, there's a lot of good news. These fish are wild, they have demonstrated resiliency, they have refugia, and they have quality natal habitat. So if actions are taken to restore SCRs, there's absolutely no question that these wild fish are gonna respond. And what once was, look at the size of those fish, those are steelhead, can be steelhead as big as your children. Again, this is what you did in the 40s, 50s, and 60s on your honeymoon. Here's a school of Chinook waiting to spawn, waiting to go up a spawning tributary. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions through Rick. And one more thing, if you have questions we don't get to tonight, feel free to email me. There's my email address. And check out the other links that Jake posted on your FFI website. There's going to be additional materials there. Okay, I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, Russ, thank you very much. That's fantastic presentation. Rick, do we have questions? We actually don't at this point in time. So I'll start off while people think. Um, and uh, Russ, you know, as you know, you and I have been both involved in this a long time. And we've been telling everybody that the Snake River dams were essentially the, uh, the critical issue for snake basin fish since the, since the mid 90s. So almost 25 years. Um, Representative Simpson's plan addresses that. People are starting to listen a little, but uh, you know, the, we know these discussion, these decisions are not often not made on the science, they're made on cultural and political things. Do you want to talk a little bit about Representative Simpson's plan? It's the first really comprehensive kind of clear-eyed plan I've seen in work on this in 30 years. Yeah, I, you know, I guess I would preface this by saying, you know, obviously I'm a scientist, not a politician, but the thing that's impressed me about Representative Simpson and his staff is they have gone all in on this issue and they've been studying it for about three years now and talking to a lot of stakeholders and spending the time to understand the science. And as a result, it is a science-based recovery plan, unlike the plans that have come out of a number of the agencies over the past 25 years. And I think one of the real brilliant aspects of the plan is there's a real attempt to keep all the players in the basin whole. And one of the key points of the plan, I think, is, and Representative Simpson was on a radio interview today, uh, Idaho Matters through BSU Radio, and he made a couple of real important points. The first one he made is that we've tried everything else. The science has clearly been reinforcing that we have to improve those SARs. The best way to do that, as I showed with PATH, is through restoring the snake basin. And so Representative Simpson clearly said, you know, we've tried everything else. We're down to making, taking actions that we know are essential to recovery. And his, his efforts to keep everybody else whole while achieving fish recovery, I think is really, really important. Um, there was another thought I was gonna share and I just yeah, let lost me, it. Let me jump in, Russ. Um, so you're gonna read a lot about this regionally, perhaps even nationally over the next some months as it gets discussed. Uh, Governor Brad Little has just come out kind of against this plan because he wants to hold on to the lower snake dams. In contrast, Governor Kate Brown from Oregon has come out for the plan and Gov the Governor Inslee in Washington is very much leaning toward, toward the plan. So you're gonna see differences of an opinion. The right. people up in Lewiston and Clarkston that sit on the reservoir of the uppermost dam, Lower Granite, are kind of against it uh, because it'll disrupt the port and the shipping that takes grain and, and the wood chips for uh, paper products out of Lewiston. 
Um, at the same time, the plan includes a significant chunk of money. I can't remember whether it's like 300 or $500 million that would go toward redevelopment uh, in the Lewiston <coughs> area. And that's, that's one thing that Simpson's plan has done. They've identified all the stakeholders, ask them, you know, not only what their concerns are, but what the money associated with their concerns are, and in, inevitably have given them half again to twice in this plan of whatever it is. So the yeah, oh, opportunity is there for creative, visionary people to really take some of these things and run with them rather than holding on to uh, drawing a line in the sand or saying, not in my backyard. So uh, I'm hoping that happens. Yeah, I guess the other thing I was gonna add that I, I had the senior moment there for a second. Um, one of the really important points that Representative Simpson made today in, in his radio interview was, you know, there are options for irrigation and wheat transport and power production, but there are no options for these fish. If we lose these fish, they are gone. They are irreplaceable. And we are not going to have the salmon that the town I live in, the Salmon River, the Salmon River Mountains were named after. And so because we have these other alternatives for these other uses and, and they're certainly important, we do have some flexibility in how we do things. And again, the, the science has really been clear about where the needs are. So, you know, I think that's really one of the strengths of the plan. And as Rick said, unfortunately, there has been kind of a knee jerk reaction among some people to it. And I guess what I'm hopeful of is that people will actually take the time to read it, understand it, see what potentially is in it for them and how we could collaborate because restoring these runs is gonna be a win-win for the whole Northwest. It's gonna benefit not only Idaho, but Oregon and Washington. And you know, it, it would be a tremendous economic boon to those states. And I can't think of anything else that would bring that sort of a boost to economies. Tom, um, Russ, three. I, I, I kind of ask that we have a relatively small group. We haven't gotten any written questions. So I kind of ask if it's possible to open this up so that if any of our 20 some 21 participants has a question, it's a relatively small group as opposed to some of the casting or tying ones that can bring in 90 to 100. So I think we could actually handle some questions directly if people want to, if we have the ability to do that. Russ, there are three three comments that I could add to this. Rick uh, spoke to the opportunity and uh, the, uh, the information I'm receiving is the opportunity for this to move forward as a, a viable proposal uh, probably is as good as we've seen in a while. So I think there's reason to be hopeful to see this move forward and it and it is a comprehensive plan that addresses needs of, of all the stakeholders, hopefully, which is pretty, you know, quite often that's not the case. Uh, another comment that I'll make that is really, really important and you stress this over and over again. Uh, my background is endangered species research and recovery primarily mammals, reptiles, birds, and so forth. And the ingredient that invariably is not there in many of the populations we're trying to recover is that genetic health and resilience. And that does, as you've illustrated uh, quite adequate, adequately, does exist in these wild salmons. And this is an incredible opportunity to not forgo. So if, if we can move forward with those measures that take advantage of this level of resilience, uh, you know, success is, you know, it's, it, there is a potential for success without question. So I uh, have gotten a couple of questions. Uh, Russ, um, you can jump in and I'll help if you need me. Uh, the first one's from Terry Dix and asks, what are the alternatives for water for irrigation and then the second one is, what are the largest commercial interests, such as the dam owners and operators, uh, I suppose the barge folks and, and Lewiston stand on the new proposal? So, okay. so the, the first one in irrigation, I'm not an expert on these things, but one example, um, 
you know, at one of the hearings, there were there were members of vineyards in Washington that uh, were coming out and, and saying how important these reservoirs are for their irrigating their vineyards because, you know, they have easy access to the reservoir water and, and to get that water up to their um, vineyards. And one of the options is to have subsidies to help them have pumping systems, they're going to have to raise the water higher, but it's it's a very feasible alternative to having the reservoir level stay where it is, and you still get the water. The water's still there. They still have their water right. Um, in terms of how these other interests have responded, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. I said it's important for people to realize that these four dams sit down in a canyon, and they yeah. are what we call run of the river dams. They're about 70 feet high. So they don't really have a lot of flood control and the water still has to go up to, to irrigate anything ab above or it has to go a long ways horizontal. So as you said, there's, there's like 14 family farms, some of them large corporate kind of farms, but you could easily um, with the kind of money that's being talked about, put in pump stations and provide water to those people. Right, so that's one example of an alternative. Um, you know, another example for wheat transport is a high-speed rail system. And there's actually some benefit over barging to that because with climate change, the barges, my understanding is, have not been as dependable um, as, they, as they were in the past. Um, the second question about, you know, the operators, um, I haven't seen all the responses. I know that there has been pushback uh, against the kind of knee-jerk reactions in some cases. But one of, the, um, one of the issues about Lewiston, when Lower Granite Dam was built and the Lower Granite Pool filled, there was a lot of discussion about the economic boon that would come to Lewiston, Idaho. And that has never materialized. And in fact, the Port of Lewiston has been heavily subsidized by you and I as taxpayers. So there's, there's an a opportunity to become a lot more efficient in how we do things in the basin. And, as Representative Simpson talked about today in the radio interview, you know, Bonneville Power Administration has faced some severe economic struggles, and this is another opportunity for to assist with that, help things be more efficient, have a, maybe a more diverse way of developing power for the for the basin. Um, and again, you know, I'm a scientist. My expertise is with the fish and the habitat. So the, these other interests are not really something that I track clearly, but so Rick, Russ, do you want to add anything? I am hearing a little bit of rumblings within the environmental communities about opposition, uh, potential opposition, focusing around two areas. And, and one of them is that within the proposal is a moratorium against ESA and litigation on the major dams like Bonneville, John Day, and so forth. Um, but when you read the proposal more closely, it allows uh, for litigation or for dam owners on tributary dams, like down on the Condit and the White Salmon, aging small tributary dams that block historic access. There's a process and, and indeed funding in place to help um, offset uh, the costs and impacts of taking those kind of dams out. So it's not a complete moratorium. It's really on the major um, dams like Grand Coulee and John Day that are big megawatt producers. All right. So it looks like there's another question, Rick. Yeah. It says, uh, are the electric generation dams of any significance? The, so, so I can answer that. Um, yeah. So the four lower snake dams on average produce about 3% of the power base for the Columbia River system. The big, the big drivers here are those four Columbia River dams and nobody's talking about breaching those dams. So the, the snake really is a fair, fairly minor producer. And again, there are alternative ways to meet that power demand through you know, perhaps renewable energy sources. Um, That's a good question. We know this system too well, and sometimes we forget to provide the context. Yeah. And again, I, you know, I focused on the fish. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of good information out there on things like the power generation of these dams and information on the, what the economic hit that these communities in Idaho have taken. Um, 
you know, one of the comments I saw recently was this would be devastating to Idaho. Well, we've already been devastated by the loss of these fish from an ecological standpoint, from a cultural standpoint for the tribes and from an economic and recreational standpoint for the rest of us that love to fish for salmon and steelhead. Well, Russ, Jeff just asked if the plan is for complete dam removal. I believe it's talking about primarily a breach. So there would still be uh, a portion, but it would restore that free flowing river. Yeah, all of these dams have a concrete section, which is where the turbines are, and then they have an earthen berm that actually completes the dam. And so the removal would be to take the earthen berms out. Right. And I guess the other thing to keep in mind, there's about, oh, I think it's 140 miles of riparian area that would be restored on both sides of the river if the snake was made free flowing. And, you know, there's a real opportunity there for, you know, again, vineyards and crops and other things, as well as tremendous recovery of wildlife habitat that was inundated by these reservoirs. And that, that whole reach is proposed to go into a national uh, recreation area. So uh, recreation, camping, boating, so forth would be encouraged. Yeah. Some people have, have termed the, the result of the plan as rewilding the snake, which is kind of a neat term. It is interesting. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, uh, we're, we're running out of time tonight. I think we've addressed the questions. Is that correct, Rick? Yes, uh, so, uh, we've addressed everything that's come in. Okay, well, listen, I think I'll, I'll bring things to close tonight. Uh, Russ, I thank you again very much. It's a very good presentation. Uh, I think we'll probably want to, if, and, and we'll circle back to make sure we've got proper per permissions and so forth, but I think we're certainly going to want to use the length of this recording as reference and share it, especially with our members and, and community at every opportunity, especially as this proposal of, of Simmons is, is, or Simpson is, is moving forward and, and hopefully it's gonna continue in that direction. I, I think it will, I'm not sure we know exactly what it's gonna look like when it begins to emerge, but it certainly has a, it's a, it's a good sound proposal at the onset. So again, thank you and I'd like to, uh, remind the uh, the viewers tonight that uh, this is your presentation. Uh, it is recorded. You can go to flyfishersinternational.org and right there at the top of the page you'll find links to the recorded webcast, not, not just these but the others for this season and season one as well. So certainly go back and, and review these. They're very interesting. And uh, again, it's you members that, that make this possible. And uh, considering the, the, uh, the topic of tonight, not only does this, uh, do you make this webinar possible, you make possible the sharing of this very important scientific information relative to solving a really important conservation dilemma, which is the loss versus recovery of wild salmonids, which I'll add are, are not just out there. There is a, a high economic value associated with these fishes and their, their various uses, the role that they play, the importance to other species in those environments as well. So that's very important. So I sincerely thank all of you for, uh, for supporting this program, for supporting uh, Fly Fishers International uh, as members, uh, I'd encourage you to encourage your friends who fly fish and are interested in these matters to also join the organization, support what we do, and leave personal legacies for fly fishing, conservation, yourselves, and others. So with that, thank you again, especially thank you, Russ. Very, very good presentation. Good night to everyone. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Thanks, Russ. Thanks, guys. You Bye, bet. Rick. Bye, Tom. Good night.